Greetings, and welcome back to the podcast. This episode, we are joined by Mr. Steve Lucas, CEO of Obsidian Energy, a TSX-listed energy company with a market cap of approximately $750 million, as well as a partner at Front4 Capital Group, a value-based investment management firm. Prior to Obsidian and Front4, Mr. Lucas has also held roles including Director at Credit Suisse Securities, where he was a Portfolio Manager and Head of Investment Research. Mr. Lucas has also held other roles, including a senior investment analyst at Pirate Capital and worked within the corporate finance and distribution group of Scotial Capital, where he focused on the structuring and syndication of leveraged loans and high-yield debt. Mr. Lucas started his career at the restructuring firm Zolful Cooper, where he assisted corporate clients in the development and implementation of operational and financial restructuring plans. Mr. Lucas received a Bachelor of Arts degree in Finance and Accounting from New York University. Among other things, we sat down and discussed hedge fund strategies and returns, restructuring Obsidian, and the opportunities going forward. Enjoy. This podcast episode is sponsored by Conate Water Solutions. Do you need cost-effective water sourcing options to supply your next drilling or completions program? Conate Water Solutions is a specialized hydrogeology company focused on water well drilling, testing, and water management services in Western Canada and Texas. Contact info at conatewater.com or check out conatewater.com for more details. This episode is brought to you by Galatea Technologies. Galatea is a software company based in Calgary that is focused on helping producers better manage their fluid logistics. Galatea enables field operators and truck drivers with the ability to make the optimal decision on every waste, water, or clean oil load resulting in 20% savings on trucking and disposal costs. The Galatea platform makes it easy to create digital truck tickets, manifests, and shipping documents that automatically flow through the field data capture and finance systems. Galatea's platform is used by over 50% of Canadian producers, 600 trucking companies, and hundreds of disposal locations. Visit GalateaTech.com to learn more about how to optimize that last line on your lease op. This podcast is brought to you by Energy United. Energy United is an organization with a mission to promote practical energy policy across Canada. Energy United is building a community of Canadians that are passionate about Canada's natural gas and oil industry and are willing to take action. Energy United is driving change on issues that matter, all the way from the carbon tax to the emissions cap. Join Energy United to make a difference at energyunited.ca. Good morning, Mr. Lucas. Thank you very much for doing this. Pleasure to be here. I really appreciate your time, and I know the audience well. You are the CEO of Obsidian Energy. You are also a partner at Front4 Capital Group. Thank you. Good to be here. I've been a uh, a listener of, of some of your prior podcasts, so I'm honored to, uh, to now be uh, on the show. I thought for today we could orient the conversation around my passion for investing slash head funds, and then get into Obsidian. Absolutely. Happy to do so. Also, to back up, you have a big fan base on Twitter. So I don't know if you know that or not, but... Um, I don't know if that's a good thing, but, you know, I, I don't really tweet much, but, um, you know, we'll see what the future holds, so to speak. Shout out to the fans on Twitter slash X. Uh, they're the ones who connected us, so... Great. You have a big fan base. Appreciate the, <laughs> uh, the connection. <clears throat> well... To start from the beginning, what is Front4 Capital Group? Yeah, so Front4 is a um, value-based investment management firm. We've been around since 2019, uh, 2009, I should say. Traditionally, at the onset, it was a hedge fund structure that invested across the capital structure. So in times when there would be opportunities within distressed debt, as there was coming out of the financial crisis in 2008. You know, we were very active in participating and investing in some of those opportunities, and we're able to see those companies through and those investments through, such that they emerged from from bankruptcy. Um, in some instances, other instances, we restructured them out of court, and then evolved into more what I would call a traditional equity market. So we always had a, a value based approach. You know, I think it's fair to say that we were 
what some people would call an activist. You know, we always deemed ourselves to be more of a constructivist. And, you know, we're really focused on opportunities where we could improve a company's operations in instances where a company was being undermanaged. In some instances, there were opportunities to merge companies that would yield a significant amount of, of cost savings. And, and so we were successful in catalyzing some of those. And, you know, kind of more recently, we've evolved such that, you know, we've backed away from, you know, our public equity investment. So we no longer run, we would call a, a pooled equity portfolio and really have a handful of chunkier, you know, private investments. We were part of a consortium in early 2022 that took a REIT by the name of Commodore REIT Private. And that was a $5.7 billion transaction where we sold three and a half billion of assets at the closing table. So, you know, a complex transaction and, and really have backed ourselves into a, uh, you know, what is arguably the, the premier land bank, um, residential land bank in, in the greater Montreal area. So we've evolved and I think it's fair to say we've gone to the point of our careers where there's certain things that we're good at, certain things I think we'd, we'd admit that we're not as good at. And, you know, also have had the, uh, the fortune of being able to be a little choosier in regards to how we spend our time and, and what we want to focus on from here. To rewind the clock, how did you get into investing? I actually started my career on the financial restructuring side, which you know turned out to be apropos as it relates to my role here at Obsidian. So I worked for a uh, firm by the name of Zolfo Cooper, initially out of college, and they were a firm that would work with troubled companies, i.e. companies that were in some state of financial distress and most probably were in workout groups, you know, within the loan departments of banks. Interestingly enough, my first engagement immediately upon graduation was a Canadian company by the name of Loan Group, which is based um, in Vancouver at the time, or a suburb of Vancouver. And so that was my first exposure, you know, kind of out of college and was there for, for a bit and ultimately decided that I wanted to change tracks a bit and and and, and wound up joining Scotia Capitals, uh, or at the time Scotia Bank's Leverage Finance Group in New York, where we originated leverage loans and high yield debt that sometimes would turn into restructuring opportunities. It's a great opportunity. It was a lean group, and so by extension, there was a lot of deal flow, you know, kind of at the group level on a per capita basis. And Scotia had a very interesting client roster at the time. You know, they backed a lot of entrepreneurial types in the 80s and, and, and 90s and, you know, had a pretty interesting list of of what I would call loyal clients and that some of these clients were looking to do, you know, very interesting transactions and had an opportunity to work on a number of leveraged buyout transactions and, you know, material corporate acquisitions. So I spent the better part of you know, four or so years there and, you know, truly got to understand the leveraged capital markets and then kind of fixed income markets and how they work and, you know, how investors think about them and, and, and how pricing works and structuring works, et cetera. And then from there, you know, I'd say I was always fairly active since probably was 18 or so years old, just investing my own capital, which wasn't much at the time, but obviously grew as I continued to work. And I found myself becoming more interested in the transactions that Scotia's clients were doing as opposed to doing the actual financing. So there was an opportunity to join a hedge fund, which at the time was really kind of a, an, you know, an activist investor. It was called Pirate Capital. And I joined there in sort of been early 2005. And, you know, we went on a great run. I mean, performance was excellent. We grew to over $2 billion in assets while I was there. I would consider that era, that 2005 to 2007 era is almost, you know, kind of vintage 1.0 of the modern era of kind of activism where a lot of it was um, focused on pushing companies into strategic alternatives, asking the boards for them to aggressively buy back stock, et cetera, you know, kind of more financial engineering in nature. And that was a function of the fact that the leverage buyout markets at the time were extremely frothy and it felt as if private equity firms were trying to buy everything that wasn't bolted down to the floor. And that obviously, you know, led to a future distress cycle during the great financial crisis. So after, you know, having been at the hedge fund for, you know, a bit over a year, maybe the better part of a year and a half, 
I had an opportunity to join Credit Suisse, and you know they had a very large proprietary trading operation at the time, as many of the banks did um, back then. And you know I had an opportunity to run my own portfolio, and so left to go do that, which was interesting. It was different in the sense that. On one hand, a significant amount of responsibility, given that we had billions of dollars of capital at, at our disposal. On the other hand, it came with some of the bureaucracy, if you will, of, of, of kind of working at a larger institution. At the time, you know, I didn't like the credit market, so I had a dual mandate. I could invest in both equities and I could invest in, in credit as well. Didn't like the credit markets. Um, was minimally invested prior to 2008 or into the financial crisis which in theory would have left us very, very well positioned, you know, take advantage of distressed opportunities in 2009 and, and beyond. But it, going back to my comment on large institutions and bureaucracy, post-08, a number of the banks basically exited large aspects of their proprietary trading business, businesses. They suffered losses and, or even if they didn't suffer losses, you know, investor risk appetite was waned in regards to the volatility that some of those investments can bring. And they all directionally retrenched and Credit Suisse was one of those firms that definitely retrenched on the proprietary trading side and really tried to center around their investment bank and their private banking franchise. And then from there, you know, joined my old partners at Front 4 Capital. And here we are, you know, the better part of you know, 15 years later. So fair to say I've been involved kind of on the investing side for the better part of 20 years. And I've seen kind of the market and the market structure change considerably over that time period. Did you have a investing style or influence? Maybe uh, like a Ken Griffith at Citadel or Jim Simmons at Renaissance Technologies? Yeah, I mean, our style was, you know, markedly different than those two firms who obviously have been tremendously successful. Ours has always been more of a value-based approach, not to suggest that Citadel doesn't pursue value-based opportunities. But, you know, I think the way we've always thought about it is, you know, you look at it through a value lens, but, you know, where the rubber meets the road is trying to discern between an attractive opportunity versus an attractive valuation because the two are very, very different. I mean, some companies and or industries are destined to be cheap for a very long period of time, and sometimes for good reasons. Other instances, you know, you may have a company or an industry trading cheaply for a transient you know, period of time, and that is potentially an attractive opportunity. So, and what we found is that, you know, we were very, very good at understanding what potentially was an attractive opportunity and in some instances serving as the catalyst to catalyze kind of the opportunity. So put another way, you've had stocks trading at discounts to their intrinsic value and you know sometimes with the drivers of, of closing that gap between trading value and intrinsic value. When I was preparing for the conversation, I was reading about front four and one of your strategies is the value event driven opportunity. For those who are what is a value event driven opportunity? Yeah, I mean, look, value event or event driven is, you know, the definition has changed over the years. I mean, if you go back into the 80s, I mean, typically that would mean merger arbitrage. So you would have an announced transaction and the transaction would not have yet closed and you would assess, you know, the strength of the merger agreement and, you know, the time that it would take to close and you know, whether it would need a regulatory review or not. And if, if so, what the chances that it would close and the timetable to do so. And you would invest, assuming that the return profile was attractive enough. And the reality is, is that most deals close. And if you can avoid, you know, the one or two a year that don't, you probably wind up doing okay in that strategy. Clearly, in the 80s, when, you know, merger arbitrage first really took off, interest rates were a lot higher. So kind of absolute returns in that strategy were quite attractive. You know, over time, more capital entered the space and competed returns away and, and returns down. And investors started to expand the sandbox, if you will, and start to invest in other event-driven opportunities. So it could be spinoffs where you have a company that has a division that they decide they want to spin off, or it could be a situation where you know, a company that has a division that you think they may be likely to sell, or they may actually announce their intention to sell it. And you simply are speculating on what the price will be, and you have a view that the price may be higher than the market is forecasting. Or in some instances, it's quite the opposite, where you don't think it will transact or it will transact 
at a material lower value than you believe is being discounted, and you short the stock. So you started to see the definition of event-driven um, change. You know, it also, it's fair to say, it probably encompasses distressed debt, or in some instances, credit opportunities that are byproducts of other corporate events. So, you know, very often when you see a merger announcement, you know, the existing bonds will have a change of control provision, and you typically can can put the bonds at a small premium to par. So it, it really just is a, a bit of a fancy way of saying, you know, you're investing in some level of corporate change. The problem with uh, investing on a event-driven opportunity, sometimes you fall into a value trap. How do you avoid the value trap? Yeah, I mean, it comes back to kind of my earlier comment where, to your point, I mean, you have to discern between an attractive opportunity and an attractive valuation. Otherwise, you know, if it's simply an attractive valuation, it may just turn out to be a value trap. And so that's a bit of art versus science. And I think it also, it's probably fair to say, what is an attractive opportunity has changed over in the last 10 years. Market structure has changed and passive investors represent a larger percentage of the market. Quant-based strategies represent a larger percentage of the market. And so you need to understand the kind of the factors that they're using that are, that are driving their investments. Your traditional value-based hedge funds have decreased in the way of assets under management or and by extension influence. And so you need to take all that into account in regards to how you screen for opportunities. With the era of low interest rates, it's made the short-oriented funds have had a rough time. Some of them have closed down. Have you had to – do you short much in the fund or how do you think – Well, we don't, we, don't, we don't run a, 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 a pooled portfolio today currently. In the years prior, I mean, we did. I wouldn't say that – Shorting, shorting to, to generate alpha, a core focus. I think people, sh you know, use the word shorting at times generically. I mean, sometimes you short stocks or short indices because you're simply trying to hedge and dampen market volatility. And then there's other instances where you are truly shorting a stock because or a bond because you believe it is going to go down as well. And I'd say to you that most investors are not good at both. You know, you tend to either be very good at shorting, which can be difficult at times because the market bias is to go up, you know, or you're just good alongside. I've rarely seen investors that are very, very good at both, unless it's someone who is myopically focused on one specific industry. And by extension, that's all they focus on. And they've got a very good sense as to appropriate valuations for individual stocks and, and by extension are able to uh, invest on both sides. The popularity of the Vanguard index funds and the S&P 500 has made it harder for the hedge fund world in some ways. But on the other hand, if you can provide value, it creates opportunity. How do you present the value opportunity for investors who do have the option of the S&P 500? Is it a premium over the index or how do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think, you know, I operate under a, a very simple thesis, which is capital ultimately flows to those who treat it best, right? And, and then the question becomes, well, how do you define best, right? Because best doesn't always mean the best absolute returns, because that typically comes with a degree of market volatility. There's certainly plenty of investors that, you know, are seeking smoother returns. And, and so against that backdrop, you know, you're looking to provide investors should be looking to provide, you know, superior risk-adjusted return relative to whatever index is appropriate for their investment strategy. And and so I think that's ultimately the lens through which you need to look at it. And and then just to take it one step further, what also come enters the equation or should enter is liquidity profile. If someone is asking you to make an investment in a private where your liquidity is undefined, then by extension, you should definitively seek a higher return to compensate you for that. And if you have unabated access to liquidity, either because you know, the underlying investments are public equity investments or the liquidity rights, you know, kind of within a fund structure, investor friendly, then that's going to enter the calculus as well as to, you know, what is an attractive return. To summarize it, one way that's been explained to me is uh, you can earn roughly 10% annually in S&P for 10 years, which is really hard to beat. But the value prop for some hedge funds is that you may not get 10, but you'll get a smooth eight or nine every single year. Is that a pretty simple explanation of some value props for hedge funds? Yeah. I mean, listen, I think once again, it depends on strategy. I mean, some equity-based hedge funds have 
a value proposition where they're not very directional. I mean, by extension, in theory, they shouldn't have large drawdowns if and when the market trades down significantly. You as an investor are willing to potentially sacrifice absolute returns for that. Or that, you know, you they can generate returns very similar to the market, but just taking less risk, you know, in, in, in doing so. You know, I think once again, going back to my comment, it depends on, at the point in the cycle that you're in. Up until two years ago, I mean, interest rates were low, right? And so by extension, credit strategies were just not that attractive. And you saw investors reaching for yield, you know, by plowing into real estate investments and, and what have you. And now you're in an environment where for the first time in a long time, you are actually being paid to take credit risk. And you can very easily earn, you know, kind of very high single digits and you know, arguably 10% returns without taking a lot of credit risk. And so the type of return to invest in an equity-based hedge fund is going to change now and should be higher to compensate you for the fact that you can easily achieve 10% returns in credit. Whereas two or so years ago, if a long short fund was generating 10% returns without a lot of volatility, an investor may have deemed that to be very attractive. So, you know, cycles are dynamic and, and they change and, and so do investor expectations. So I think it's fair to say that looking at it as a, as an, as a passive investor now from a equ public equity markets perspective, you're in an interesting market because you have a market that's at highs. You have a significant amount of dispersion, right? You have a significant amount of the return that is embedded within your big seven tech stocks that have continued to perform. And under the hood, you have a lot of other stocks and industries that have not done as well. So, you know, that obviously creates opportunities and risks and and you have, you know, that dynamic against an overlay of interest rates going up and targeted investor returns going up, you know, kind of as well, or certainly the risk-free rate going up. So, you know, it's an interesting market. You overlay that with a U.S. presidential election, and I think it's probably fair to say that somewhere along the way, you will see a fair amount of volatility, and that'll create a new set of opportunities. It's been the era of easy money the last maybe 10, 15 years with rates going up, although it's historically speaking, they're still not high yet. But how do you see that impacting traditional assets, say, in the energy industry? Do you see more value from assets like that going forward? Yeah, listen, I think it's fair to say that by historical metrics, rates aren't high. Exactly. I, I think it's also fair to say that there's so much debt that's been accumulated kind of in the world, both at the sovereign levels as well as at the household levels, that the world also can't of stomach interest rates kind of much higher from here. And so you have a bit of a kind of a push-pull in that regard. In regards to energy, you know, look, I think it's fair to say that energy has fallen out of favor over the last 10 years. And there's a number of reasons for that. Kind of the underlying volatility in the commodity, or more specifically oil, is certainly part of that. I think it's also fair to say that historically, energy companies were not good stewards of capital. They destroyed a lot of capital with some of their development plans and development programs. And against that backdrop, you know, just going back to my earlier comment that capital typically flows to those who treat it best. I mean, energy boards and management teams didn't treat it very well on the equity side. So, you know, that's an input. And I think it's fair to say that, you know, you have had a dynamic where, generally speaking, the tech sector and other sectors have worked phenomenally well, and it's somewhat the path of least resistance, right? And so to to continue to go with what has worked, and so there really hasn't been a need to to shift one's portfolio, other than maybe in 2022 when you did see energy outperform and you know tech had a had a rougher go of it. When I look at energy today, I think it's fair to say that you've clearly seen you know a significant higher degree of capital discipline and focus on returns on the part of boards and, and management teams. I think it's also fair to say that, you know, some of the more negative commentary and sentiment around ESG is starting or has abated and seemingly continues to abate. I think two years ago, there was a view that you know, we'd all be driving EVs by 2030 or 2035. I think that is starting to become debunked. And I think it's fair to say that oil demand growth is going to continue to grow. The The pace of that growth may change as it relates to its historical relationship with economic growth and population growth, but the trajectory is still one of growth. So there's that. And then I think you're starting to clearly see 
a trend of consolidation, which is obviously much, much more pronounced in the U.S. at this juncture. It will inevitably filter up to Canada. Obviously, we saw a large transaction announced yesterday, even in the way of Enterplus, although arguably you could argue it was more of a U.S. company. But, you know, one cannot avoid the trend, which is that you will see more consolidation. Um, and then on a comparative basis, Canadian companies are, are small compared to their U.S. peers. And so some management teams and boards, I think, are embracing of that. Others are maybe have their head in the sand or hopeful that things go back to the way things used to be. So I think it's fair to say as you see more consolidation and larger, you know, more streamlined, you know, more cost competitive companies with, you know, most probably cheaper costs of capital emerge, I think energy will definitively garner more investor attention. The sector has been undervalued. How much opportunity is there in the undervalued energy sector right now? Is it still undervalued or how, how are you thinking of it? Like, Well, I think there's degrees of undervalued. I mean, we can argue that multiples at large should be greater. And, and I think you can you can make that argument, right? I mean, you can look at energy and kind of on a on a mid-cycle price kind of implied free cash flow yield, and it is attractive. Clearly, in the small mid-cap space, it's arguably even more attractive, although I think you need to be a bit discerning in regards to which companies have kind of assets and, and value propositions that are potentially attractive versus those who, who don't. I think to some degree, the market has kind of bunched them all together. And then there's not a high degree of differentiation, or maybe there's not as, as high a degree as I think there should be kind of in regards to multiples, just given that some companies are inventory rich, some companies won't pay taxes for a long time because of tax pools they have. Others are inventory constrained and are subscale and never going to get the scale. So I think all that needs to be taken into account. And then clearly, as it relates to natural gas, natural gas pricing is obviously extremely weak, both because you've seen too much drilling and, and when they're not really show up over the last two years. And and I think it's fair to say that, you know, that creates some, potentially creates some opportunities, although arguably some of the public equities aren't discounting the front end of the curve as much and are banking on a recovery, you know, 12, 18 months out. Well, that's a bit of a cross section of uh, front four, but maybe we can get into uh, Obsidian Energy now. Getting back to the basics, you are the CEO of Obsidian Energy, but for the listener, what is Obsidian Energy? So Obsidian Energy is is kind of the former Penn West Trust. So clearly, you know, there's a fair amount of history there, and it would have been you know one of the largest income trusts you know during that part of the cycle. And you've seen the company slim down considerably, both in the way of scale of operations, and somewhere along the way there was a rebranding, and I want to say in early 2017. Today, Obsidian is largely a cardio producer. That's a play that's been long established since the 1950s in Western Canada. You know, continues to generate strong oil-weighted production and by extension, very good cash flow and ultimately free cash flow attributes. And we still have a very attractive inventory position within the cardio and, and can continue to keep our production flat for a very, very long period of time and, and grow it if it makes sense. We have a growth position in the way of our Peace River acreage, which offers us exposure to both on the Blue Sky Formation as well as the Clearwater. You know, the Clearwater the last couple of years has gotten a fair amount of attention from public and, and private investors. And we have a small position in the Viking on the Alberta side of the border that generates a couple thousand BOEs a day. And, you know, we're quite happy with the performance of that asset. So today it's a, you know, small mid-cap, or at least mid-cap by Canadian standards, oil-weighted operator. You became the CEO in December of 2019, if I'm correct. How did you end up as CEO? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting story only because if you would have told me that I'd be the CEO of Obsidian, I would have said you were crazy. If you would have told me I would do so and I'll still be here. I'd say you're even crazier. But just going back to you know my earlier commentary, at Front 4, we did invest in underperforming companies or companies that felt we felt could be better operated. And going back to, we invested when Obsidian was Penn West and, and they had a managerial change and brought in an individual by the name of Dave Roberts at the time. And Dave kind of commenced the process of streamlining the 
the portfolio a bit, focusing capital. And I think it's fair to say that prices going down in late 14 you know, somewhat derailed that. The company had a, a financing structure at the time, which also made it very difficult to sell assets at a faster pace only because you couldn't pay down the bonds. They had what they called make whole provisions, which would have forced you to pay material premiums to unwind the structure. And so that was unfortunate because in 2013, early 14, you could have sold assets at very good valuations. So we had a small position at the time. Um, And then ultimately, the company was successful in mid-2016 in selling their Saskatchewan operations at a very large number. Um, a number that was probably order of magnitude, two hundred million, two hundred fifty million dollars higher than the market expected. So going back to our commentary on on event driven, I mean, had you speculated on the ultimate price for the Saskatchewan side of the business, you would have been positively surprised and ultimately rewarded. So on the back of that, you know, we increased our position. The company did bring in a new CEO by the name of Dave French and. We simply just didn't agree on strategy from there. And so felt it was a better way to operate the company. You know, we ran an activist campaign um, and ran a, a proxy contest and put up four directors for nomination. Ultimately came to a settlement with the Obsidian board. Myself and uh, a gentleman by the name of Mike, Mike Foss joined the board in the spring of 2018. And we were plodding along and, you know, somewhere along the way, the board made a change and, or there was a change. and. You know, Mike became the CEO for a period of time, and you know he was solely focused on cleaning the company up from an operational perspective. And along the way, there was a decision here in Alberta called the Redwater Decision that ultimately adjudicated that asset retirement obligations, which are you know your obligations as it relates to ultimately abandoning a well after it has ceased producing, or you know ultimately reclaiming. Land, or you know, and and the you know, same thing with some of the facilities where, after you you no longer need you know, certain facilities, you you need to abandon them, right? You need to return the land, you know, back to its previous state, and those obligations kind of reside on the balance sheet. And what Redwater decision adjudicated was that for years, for decades, asset retirement obligations are always deemed to be behind the banks. In priority, behind secured creditors in the way of priority. And what the ruling basically meant or adjudicated was that in a scenario where there was a restructuring or liquidation, they actually, those obligations jumped in front of the banks. And that very much scared the banks. And any company that had a medium to high degree of asset retirement obligations, unless you were massive in size and scale, you know, were put into 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 workouts, and so Mike went from having a focus on on the operations to dealing with workout bankers who can be rather cantankerous and are solely focused on getting as much of the bank's money back as they can. You know, we also had an issue, you know, with our legacy office lease, and so the old Penn West had entered into a lease on this full building at the time, and. It was the better part of a $32 million commitment. So as Penn West slash Obsidian was downsized in the way of assets, you know, they never downsized the lease. And so um, they clearly didn't need all the space because, you know, their operations were a, a shrunk in size. But you had a dynamic where, you know, they had subleased approximately 15 of that $32 million of annual exposure to various other tenants. Most of these tenants were not great from a credit quality perspective, and we were still paying $17 million a year. And just to contextualize, the company may have had an FFO base of, at the time of 130 to $140 million. So just massive from a percentage, you know, as a percentage of FFO. And then, you know, we had uh, another issue with, you know, certain ex-employees that benefited from an indemnity in their employment agreements. And you know, we were on the hook for certain legal bills. And so suffice it to say, our issues were more, you know, what I'd call legacy financial and not necessarily as performance, you know, focus at the time because, you know, Mike had done a really good job of, of improving the financial, the operational profile of the company. So given that this was my forte and I understand these issues and how to deal with them very, very well, you know, I made a decision given that 
we were front four at the time was down on his investment. And if something didn't change, you know, we were going to potentially lose our investment. And just as a makeup of me as an individual, you know, I, I hate to lose more than I like to win. The two, are, the two aren't the same. You know, everyone likes to win, right? Not everyone is prepared to do the things that you need to do in order to win and, or put another way to not to lose. So, you know, if we were going to lose our investment, it wasn't going to be, it was going to be because we had exhausted all of our options. So I agreed to step in for a period of time, which I thought would be defined as months, not years to, um, to deal with these financial issues. And so I joined, you know, the CEO in December of 19 by March of 2020, you know, we had a couple, we had settled our issue with the landlord you know, we had settled our issue with our legacy employees and their law firms and the insurers involved. You know, we had garnered an extension with the banks that was going to allow us to, you know, have some time to to kind of see through our options. And just as we were inking those respective agreements, you know, you had COVID hit. And so you didn't have, just have Obsidian you know, basically very quickly fighting for survival. I think it's fair to say you had a good percentage of the oil and gas patch fighting for survival. And it just was simply the wrong time to leave. And and there's a couple of reasons for that. I mean, obviously, you know, my reputation was linked to it now, given that I was CEO. And it just was the wrong, it would have been the wrong time to, you know, pass the baton. I'm not sure there have been many people or qualified people that have, would have wanted to take the role. So I decided to to see it through. So, you know, along the way, you know, it was obviously a bunch of twists and turns. I mean, you had banks that generally speaking were freaked out about their exposure, not just energy, but there were a lot of industries that, you know, hotel, lodging, airlines, cruise lines, you know, all those industries, you know, kind of, there were significant question marks around. And so as we looked kind of, um, you know, at at the landscape during the summer of 2020, you know, the Obsidian board, you know, which I think is an extremely dynamic board and I think is arguably proven to be among the best boards in the small mid-cap space here, you know, came to the conclusion that at the current pace, you know, we were on our path to insolvency, you know, given where oil prices were at the time. I think the same comment could have been made for many, many companies. And so, we decided to see whether we could merge with uh, with Bonterra. And the rationale being very simple. The cost savings would have been significant. The overlap, you know, between our bank syndicate and their bank syndicate, you know, was significant. And it offered investors at the time, obsidian investors at the time, notwithstanding that we didn't like the exchange ratio, a better outcome than if we simply were forced to restructure Obsidian at the time. And so, you know, we went public with that deal. You had an unwilling counterparty. And I'm a big believer in sometimes if you can't convince people, you just want to confuse them. And, you know, what the Obsidian board was able to accomplish was we bought ourselves time. We bought ourselves time to let the market heal, let our team show that they could they were indeed very good operators because we outperformed our peers that year and garner some credibility with the bank such that you know they actually wanted to give us an extension and that's effectively what happened you know we were able to get a long term extension you know from the bank syndicate and ultimately were able to refinance the banks out in the summer of 2022 when we were successful in place in a high yield deal to take out those banks who who wanted to exit. So, you know, it's funny because I've been asked a number of times, or there's been a narrative that, you know, we lost, you know, Bonterra. No, we won. We're still here. We didn't dilute our shareholders. And when the deal no longer made sense for us, you know, we um, abandoned it. And so, you know, I think that goes to, speaks to the creativity of Obsidian's board and just, just, you know, the lengths that they were willing to go, you know, kind of for their shareholders and their stakeholders. So, and, 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 I, and I would say, you know, part of, you know, what was a good portion of what was very helpful in kind of navigating those challenges was just that workout and restructuring experience that 
and leverage finance experience that I had garnered very early in my career. If I'm correct, you own about a million shares of Obsidian now. Have you felt important to bleed, so to speak, if your shareholders bleed to have skin in the game with the company as CEO? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I own a bit more than that. But I think it's fair to say that there's a, there's a direct alignment with the shareholder base. And because I am a large shareholder, Front 4 continues to be a large shareholder. Other individuals and firms that you know I have relationships with are shareholders. So I think it's fair to say that there's a direct alignment with them. Like you mentioned, the share price of sitting in August 2006, about $300. By April 2020, it was about $0.20. Cents. City has a storied history, yet it, the company's still here. You touched on it a little bit, but aside from events the last couple of years, why do you think the company's been so resilient? Yeah, listen, I think when it, people matter, right? I think it's as simple as that. And you know, when, when I look back on, on, on kind of my investing career, what I've typically seen is, you know, the people at the top and the people within the board, you know, really do matter. And and the strategic decisions that they make and the vantage points that through and the lenses through which they, you know, make those decisions have been key determinants. You know, I think it's also fair to say that, you know, kind of your capital stack and then your balance sheet matters. I mean, you know, it's fair to say that this was an over levered company at a point in time and inherently you already have a lot of leverage through the commodity itself. So when you, you know, overlay commodity leverage with balance sheet leverage, I mean, when it works, you look like a genius. And, you know, when it doesn't, you know, you look, you know, very, very foolish. And so I think, you know, we finally have been able to address, you know, what's been a perennial issue for the company, which is the balance sheet. And that's no longer a concern. And when you stop focusing or having to spend, you know, time on issues that are not, you know, potentially value creative and can, you know, you know, very much, you know, almost exclusively spend your time on, on, on how you create value for your stakeholders, which is really typically an oil and gas through the drill bit. And by extension, you know, kind of having a very strong and adept technical understanding of your land base, which arguably I think this company hasn't typically kind of understood. And I think there's no better evidence of that than, there are numerous counterparties that have bought assets from Penn West in the past and they fleeced them, right? And so, and they did very well, you know, feasting off of Penn West having to dispose assets and not truly understanding what and why, what they were selling and by extension, you know, the opportunity that, the uncaptured opportunity that um, someone else was garnering exposure to. And so I think for the first time, you know, the company, the first time at least since I've ever been involved in the company, you know, we're actually on our front foot. You know, we're the ones, you know, acquiring as we bought in the 45%, you know, working interest that we didn't own in our piece server asset. You know, we're the ones that have acquired more land, you know, by actively participating, you know, in some of these land sales. And so it's, 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 it's a marked departure from how the company has traditionally operated. The critic would say, I want a Canadian technical team to run my company. And that's, like you said, value is driven from the technical perspective. But on the flip side, do you view being an outsider as a positive attribute to running the company and a strong skill set and capital allocation? Yeah, I would say to you, look, I think if you look at some of the more successful CEOs in town, they don't necessarily have a technical background. Now, my background may be a bit more departed in the sense that I'm not Canadian, but I'm not so sure that that really, you know, kind of matters. I think it's fair to say that in oil and gas, you are reinvesting on an annual basis a significant percentage of your enterprise value, or certainly your, your equity capitalization. And so the performance of that development program has significant, you know, ramifications on the near-term performance typically of of kind of your equity. And so when you have someone who's, you know, kind of understands kind of how, understands returns, understands risk-adjusted returns, understands how investors think and ultimately, you know, what they will reward versus not reward. And I would say it's more of a positive than a negative. Some CEOs, regardless of industry, are good at creating value for themselves through salary and stock options and what have you. But you have a large chunk of ownership in Obsidian. So how do you think about creating value for the shareholders as well going forward, given that you are one? Yeah. I mean, look, 
alignment is key. It's always been key when, you know, when we invested in, in companies at, at Front Four and just understanding management of the board and, and how they are aligned with shareholders. And, you know, you hear at Obsidian, I mean, clearly, as you outlined, I own a very respectable position and there's no question as to my alignment. You also have, you know, a significant amount of alignment in the way of the the board itself. They have taken, many of them have taken a hundred percent of their director comp in the form of units. So these are deferred shared units. And, you know, given that to your point, the stock did trade down to twenty cents at a point in time during the bottom of during COVID. They own a not inconsequential amount of DSUs. And so, you know, they in turn are also extremely focused in, you know, how they maximize value for shareholders because they are in essence, you know, material shareholders themselves. So, you know, when you put it all together you know, I think you have a very shareholder-centric senior management team and board, and and we're intently focused on on closing the gap between, you know, where our shares currently trade, you know, versus what we believe, you know, intrinsic values or NAF to be, which we've been very public in stating is, you know, a material discount at this juncture. In your view, how do you get there? You're going to get there through execution. You know, we outlined a a growth plan that gets the company to 50,000 BOEs a day by 2026. And and you do that largely on the back of developing our Peace River position, which we've publicly stated we intend to grow to approximately 24,000 barrels a day during that time period. There's little value, you know, for the inventory position we believe we have, you know, within that play, you know, currently in our shares and our reserve report for that matter. Clearly, the market is telling you right here, right now that, they don't believe that we can because if they did, we wouldn't be training where we are. Against that backdrop, you know, we have been very happy to buy back our shares. You know, we did buy almost $50 million of, of, of stock back over the course of 2023, and almost half of that was in the fourth quarter alone. And so I've been in the markets for a long time and fully recognize that at times they are inefficient and at times very inefficient for that matter. And, you know, you can cry and complain about it or you can actually try to take advantage of it. And, you know, there's a saying that, you know, one of my old bosses used to say, which was, do you want to own the discount or do you want to let the market own the discount? And, you know, given that we have been aggressively repurchasing our shares, you know, we're inclined to capture that discount for ourselves and our shareholders. What's it like coming to Calgary as a outsider into a pretty close knit industry to take over a company? Is it present opportunities or is it does it present challenges or is it a bit of both? Yeah, listen, I mean I think it's been a bit of both. I think, you know, to answer the question head on, I mean, it's a lot more pleasant coming to Calgary in the recent past as opposed to years prior. Clearly the city's gone through some some hard times, just given from twenty fourteen through twenty twenty. By and large, you know, kind of it was typically a uh a rough go on the oil side of the equation. And you've seen that, you know, kind of, you know, have implications on downtown and office occupancy and what have you. Over the last 12 to 18 months, I mean, there's been a marked bounce in the city step. And you can see that in the way of restaurants being a lot more crowded and downtown being more crowded. That, that's just great to see. As it relates to more on the business side, yeah, I mean, listen, I think it's always interesting to um you know start to become a little bit more ingratiated or with some of the you know business leaders here and uh, you know that may or may not create opportunities for the future but you know i think it's fair to say that calgary's grown on me and you know the opportunity kind of at, at obsidian is is one that i'm very excited about only because we still have a lot of unfinished business right and so we're focused on taking the company to its full potential under valley city don't uh, don't share the secret. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not so sure it's going to continue to be as undervalued as it's been, just given uh, you know some of the more recent uh, mm-hmm. performance, and you know you continue to see some of the you know stats as to kind of um, projected population growth and some of the appreciation in housing price over the last 12, 18 months. It's uh, I think the secret's already getting out. In Jeb, you already touched on a little bit, but dividends versus buybacks. Obviously, you're leaning towards the buyback strategy. Now? Well, I think it's situationally specific, right? I mean, I think it's fair to say, go back to my earlier comment, energy management teams and boards have just become better stewards of capital and, and are more in tune with kind of investor needs and desires. And so 
return of capital strategies are clearly, you know, kind of a central tenant to a shareholder value proposition. I think that means, you know, different things for for different companies. I mean, we have an asset in the way of Peace River that, you know, we're not getting credit for and absent us actually starting to drill it and develop it, we never will. So it was important that we, you know, look to bring, you know, the asset closer to to its potential. I'm not saying, I'm not even suggesting that 24,000 barrels is, is its full potential, but it's an intermediate term goal that we can reassess from there. In regards to buybacks versus dividends, I think it somewhat depends on where you trade, you know, the valuation at which you trade versus your fair value. And we trade a material discount. And so it doesn't make sense for us to not capture that discount and instead the return capital via dividends, which are taxable. That Hopefully, it will also change as well, because if we execute, you know, we should become more fairly valued. And as we kind of get behind the the material upfront capital spend in order to grow our production profile, you'll be left with a an entity that generates a lot of free cash. And I think at that juncture, it would be appropriate to commence a dividend stretch. An American perspective, you are from the States, and some would say that there's a lot of value in Canada still in the energy sector particularly for the Americans looking up north. I know you can't talk about it in terms of obsidian, but do you see more Americans coming up north to refill the hopper? Yeah, I'd say a couple things. I think it's fair to say that from a public investor's perspective, valuations in Canada are generally more attractive than in the U.S. I think it's also fair to say that the type of investor um, that has the ability to meaningfully invest in Canada has a need for larger cap situations because they either have a lot of capital to deploy or if the investment isn't big enough to move their needle and they won't bother or, you know, their liquidity needs are such that, you know, it needs to be big enough in order to be able to trade in and out or adjust their position accordingly. So I do think that you will see more flows into Canada. I think you've seen that already a bit, just given some of the heavy oil producers have performed quite well, given that there's an expectation that, you know, Trans Mountain will, will will be operational um, and diff- heavy oil differentials will close here in the near term. You know, many investors I speak to are trying to wrap their head around when they try to bet on a gas recovery. So clearly there's some really attractive companies that, Canadian gas companies that have been built and that, that I do think resonate and, you know, have the attributes that a U.S. investor um, would deem to be attractive. And then looking at it on the strategic side, I wouldn't be surprised if over the next 12 to 18 months, you know, there's um, a large, you know, transaction that involves a U.S. company buying a Canadian company. You know, we've seen the reverse in the sense that for the last 10 or so years that in the sense that the U.S. Have, companies have generally been disposing of their Canadian operations. I think it's fair to say that if you're around long enough, you, you tend to see things come full circle. And so the U.S. is starting to consolidate there's clearly a couple trades that you know will occur, um, where there'll be some knock-on effects from some of the mergers that have been announced to date. And you'll probably see another couple of deals over the next 12 to 18 months, but thereafter it starts to look fairly well consolidated. And um, I could very easily see someone deciding that entering Canada is a good place to, um, to deploy their capital. I mean, I know that some of the U.S. bankers are certainly starting to pitch some of those potential ideas, and so. I'd be surprised if it doesn't transpire. Hmm. The U.S. recently announced a moratorium on LNG development. Do you view that as a temporary setback? Do you view the opportunity for Canada growing, or is the pie big enough for everyone regardless? Yeah, I, I think it's a temporary dynamic. I think it's just politics between Washington and, and Texas as it relates to the border, given that it has impl- it does disproportionately impact negatively impact Texas. But look... I mean, no one does competition better than the U.S., and the presidential election will be behind us later this year. And and I think there'll be, irrespective of who wins, there'll be a bit more of a get back to business dynamic. So I don't expect that moratorium to to last. And, and I think you will continue to see the LNG market grow, notwithstanding that I think the the pace of growth will likely slow, and some of the projects that have been contemplated. I don't think all of them will be financed and funded so and ultimately constructed. So but I still think the trend is is there. To wrap things up, what to you makes a good CEO for business or an energy company in general as you look forward? 
Yeah, listen, I think what makes a good CEO is someone who, are, who defines and articulates a clear strategy to his or her stakeholders. And, and that is really a combination of both investors as well as employees. You know, clearly, if you're a public company CEO, you need to have a, a return and value proposition that resonates and, and can compete for capital. Against that backdrop, you need to kind of have very clear goals and objectives for the organization. And and that extends beyond simply your direct reports. I've always operated under the the mantra that culture kind of stems from the top and you have to create, you know, the culture that you think is ultimately going to be most conducive to the goals and objectives that you're trying to reach. And so I think that means different things for different industries. And I think it means different things at different parts of a cycle. You go back to 2019, 2020, <laughs> it was about survival, right? For, for us and for others. And so that meant that you needed to potentially make some hard decisions and, and, and be able to make quick decisions given that it was a rapidly evolving market. As it relates to kind of where we are now, I think things are just much more steady state. And, you know, you really have to be thinking about less about the immediate near term and more about the intermediate to long term. And so we've touched upon acquisitions and just the M&A market. But I think if you're a Canadian energy CEO and, or board member, you have to be thinking about M&A, you know, just because the, the market is telling you that what is deemed to be relevant in size, you know, that bar continues to climb. And so, and most Canadian companies aren't relevant from an international capital market perspective. And obviously we would put, I'd put Obsidian in that camp as well. I think the only difference is we have a an asset in the way of Peace River that if we execute on, we can create a lot of value for our shareholders. And when that day comes that there's a transaction that makes sense for us to pursue for our shareholders, we at least get the benefit of that um, within our valuation. If you were to leave the investor with a message to wrap things up, biggest opportunity going forward, and what would you leave them with? Yeah, our biggest opportunity specific to Obsidian is obviously Peace River, which we've discussed. I look at the stock, and I don't think there's any value being ascribed to that growth plan. And so assuming we're successful, I think investors will be well compensated for it. And that's really the takeaway. I think the takeaway is, for the first time in a long, long time, this is basic blocking and tackling, which is we don't have any more of the legacy issues that have historically bogged us down to worry about. It's simply a focus on technical execution. And and against that backdrop, you know, there is not another hand that I'd rather have in the, in the patch. That's not to suggest that there aren't other great companies, because clearly there are. But simply to say, this setup, this opportunity at this valuation, at this size of company where you're not yet impeded by the law of large numbers, yeah, we're very optimistic on, on our future. Well, that's an hour. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Appreciate your time. And it's been a pleasure uh, chatting. Hope everyone enjoyed. We can end the formal conversation now. Hello, listeners out there. Thanks for checking out the podcast. Hopefully the episode provided some insights. If you enjoyed the show, check out trose.ca where more episodes are yet to come. You can also subscribe to the podcast where your token of support is much appreciated. Until next time, happy coffee drinking. Happy coffee drinking.